So we've been talking about the road of life this month, and we're going to wrap it up today. Today we're going to talk about some crashes that will occur on the road ahead. And we've been using this road metaphor uh, so that you can imagine what it's like to be rolling along, you're just kind of having a great day, and suddenly you're struck by another car. And I think of the head-on collisions that happen so often on our roads here on the Big Island as people uh, often drive without patience or they drive without proper attention to the road ahead. But this is really true in every area of life, not just literal driving a car on a road, right? You may have experienced a health crash or a relationship crash or a financial crash or a career crash. And we all experience crashes once in a while. You can't completely avoid them. And so the key is to know how to survive crashes in life. And fortunately, the Bible is full of wisdom for us on how to survive, how to even thrive after we experience a crash on the road ahead. So if you're ready to hear what God's put on my heart to share with you today, would you do me a favor and say, hit me with it, G, I'm ready. Awesome. So I need to give you a little bit of background for where I'm coming from in this message. Since I was 11 years old, I've been a computer geek. My dad and I, we actually built a Heathkit personal computer in our basement when I was 11 years old. And so we were soldering hundreds of transistors and resistors onto circuit boards. I mean, it was a really intense thing, the whole nine yards. And so Steve Jobs, who started Apple Computer in his parents' garage at the age of 20 with his best friend Steve Wozniak, he has always fascinated me. He's one of the world's greatest personal success stories. And I heard Steve Jobs give a 15-minute commencement speech at Stanford University, oh gosh, like 13 years ago, something like that. And so I've referenced it before several times in my life coaching and my blogging and my sermons. Uh, It just really had an impact on me when I heard it. Now, Steve was not a Christian. He was probably a Zen Buddhist, I think was his closest faith system that he adhered to. But honestly, when you listen to that speech, he shared some thoughts that really fit perfectly with biblical principles of Christianity. And the life lessons he shared about decision-making on the road ahead in that speech resonated with me in such a fantastic way. He speaks about a couple of major crashes that he experienced in life, and his take on that really still connects with me even all these years later. So today we're going to pull some wisdom from Steve, we're going to pull some wisdom from the Bible, and we're going to pull some wisdom from my own life experience, and we're going to talk about two big ideas related to crashes. So let me hear you say, what's the big idea, G? Thank you for asking. So today's first big idea is some crashes aren't your fault. Some crashes aren't your fault. In that speech, Steve talked about getting fired from Apple, the company he created. He had brought in John Scully, who was the CEO of Pepsi uh, before then, and over time, their two visions for the company diverged, and the board eventually sided with John Scully, and Steve got fired. He was out from the company he created in a very public way, and it was a real struggle for him. Here's what he said about it. Sometimes life hits you in the head with a brick. Don't lose faith. He also shared about the first time he got his cancer diagnosis at that time. He eventually um, died of cancer, but the first time he got it, they actually found the tumor, and it was a rare kind of situation where they were able to remove it, and he thought it was smooth sailing from there, and it was for several years until it recurred. But that's what he said about the cancer as well. Sometimes life hits you in the head with a brick. Don't lose faith. So can I get a witness for that? Can you relate to that? Has life ever hit you in the head with a brick? If it has, would you say amen? Amen. Life's definitely given me some repeated brick to the head moments. I could list injuries and illnesses and relationship pains. I could talk about getting fired from something I helped create. I could talk about the death or the injury or the illness of dear loved ones. There have been times when I thought I was doing everything right in life. And then whammo, a crash happened. Somebody hit me in the head with a brick. Something happened that was 100% not my fault. It wasn't fair. I didn't deserve it. It was devastating to me. And a lot of those types of crashes aren't accidents, right? Somebody 
cruelly and intentionally, deliberately chooses sometimes to try to wreck your life. Or in the case of a major illness, it's not that somebody deliberately harmed you, but it's still just that feeling of, oh, this isn't fair. I didn't do anything to deserve this, right? And often in the case of an injury or an illness like that, people want to blame someone. And when there's no obvious human being to blame, what do they do? They, they choose to blame God, right? Even when a crash occurs with obvious human error, people still blame God for not stopping it before it happened. And I encounter people all the time when I try to get them to come to church, I'll invite them to come to church, and they go, oh no, not doing that. And I say, why not? And they say, well, I used to go to church, I used to be a Christian, I used to be, you know, a pretty regular church person, but then my dad died or my husband died or whatever, some awful, horrible thing happened in their life and they're angry at God about it. So I don't go to church anymore because God let this horrible thing happen to me. What happened? They blamed God for a crash in their life and they lost faith. Don't lose faith. So what do you do as a Christ follower? What should you do when you experience a crash like that? What do you do even when someone deliberately hurts you, deliberately wrecks you, intentionally lobs a brick at your head? How do you come back from a crash like that, whether it's emotional or financial or vocational or relational? How do you come back from a crash? How do you get back on course on the road ahead? How do you survive a crash? Well, Steve Jobs is absolutely right about this. The first step, the most important step, is don't lose faith. Don't lose faith. Your health might be gone, your money might be gone, your job might be gone, your spouse might be gone, but your God is not gone. God is never gone. He's still large and in charge of his universe, and he's still with you, and he's still for you. He told Joshua, don't lose faith. He said, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. And then the author of Hebrews tells us that wasn't just a promise for Joshua. That's a promise for all of us who follow Jesus all through life. This is true for all of us. He himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you, so that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Would you say that last part aloud with me today? The Lord is my helper from that point forward. Would you say that and mean it? The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Boy, we just need to remember that. Don't lose faith. The Lord is your helper. Don't be afraid. What can human beings do to you ultimately? The Lord is with you. So even though you may have completely been surprised and maybe absolutely devastated by a crash that happened, don't lose faith. Trust that God was not surprised. He knew that crash was coming, and he already has a plan to bring something positive out of that horribly negative situation. Think about the Apostle Paul. Uh, man, talk about a guy who's full of faith and did amazing things for the Lord. If anybody should have, in our idea, had smooth sailing through life, right? He's doing all the right things. Why isn't he just completely blessed with health and wealth and all that great stuff we hear about? Well, that's not what happened for Paul. Paul was stoned by people. They literally threw bricks at his head, right? They threw rocks at him trying to kill him. He was beaten with whips. He was scourged and lashed. He was imprisoned. He was shipwrecked. He was bitten by a poisonous snake. And many awful things happened to him in his life. And then at one point, he had this terrible, painful illness of some kind. He called it his thorn in the flesh. He called it a messenger of Satan. And even to this day, scholars, they argue about this all the time, but nobody's really sure what this thorn in the flesh was. Some scholars think it was a painful eye condition. Some think it was a painful skin condition. Some think it was his mother-in-law. Some people just, they're not sure, right? They don't know what this was, but whatever it was, it was awful. It was a major crash, brick to the head moment. For Paul. And so he implored God three times to remove this from him. He never seemed to complain about shipwrecks or imprisonment or getting hit with rocks by people who hated him. But boy, he was completely wiped out by this thing, whatever it was. This was evidently his breaking point, the straw that broke the camel's back. And you've got one of those things too. A lot of the crashes you've experienced in your life, you've been able to just shake off. You've bounced back from those pretty easily. You just said, ah, well, you know, that's life. 
That's life. Stuff happens. I'm strong enough to overcome that. Not a big deal. But eventually, you're going to experience a major crash in your life. A brick to the head moment so powerful, it will shake you to your core. It will be too much for you to handle alone. And if that hasn't happened to you yet, buckle up, baby, because it's coming, right? It's coming on the road ahead. There's going to be a crash. We all have crashes. And so what do you do when that happens? Well, first, don't lose faith. Don't lose faith. Three times Paul cried out to God to undo the damage of this particular crash in his life. Three times God gave him the same answer. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. My grace is sufficient for you, my power is perfected in weakness. In other words, no, I'm not going to remove this painful, horrible thing, whatever it is. But my grace is sufficient for you. I'm going to give you strength to persevere. I'm going to give you the power to persevere through it, even though I'm not going to remove the thing that's hurting you. And so Paul responded, Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. In other words, if getting more power, more grace from God is the result of having weakness in my life, then pile on the weakness, baby. I want it. Give me all the weakness you can give me if that's going to make the power of Christ more evident in my life. He says, therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties. We could add with bricks to the head, with crashes for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am stronger. We could read that for where I am weak, there he is strong. And so that's true for you as well. Whatever crash you've suffered, whatever brick to the head you've encountered, don't lose faith because God's grace is sufficient for you as well. His power is perfected in your weakness as well. It's too much for you to bear. Yeah, that's true. So let God bear it instead. Sometimes a crash happens that's so big you just don't have the personal fortitude or patience or wisdom or strength to endure it. And a lot of people, when that happens, they blame God in those situations. They turn away from God. They lose their faith in God. They lose their passion for God. That's the worst possible thing you can do. Sometimes life hits you in the head with a brick. Don't lose faith because His grace is sufficient for you. That's the big idea number one today. And it leads us right into big idea number two. Everybody say, what's the big idea, G? What's the big idea, G? Awesome. So this is the big idea number two. Some crashes are what I call passion crashes. They weren't caused by someone else. It's a crash you brought about yourself because of a loss of passion. Let me share another quote from Steve's lessons to the young college graduates at Stanford. He said, when I was 17, I read a quote that went something like, if you live each day as if it were your last, someday you'll most certainly be right. <clears throat> it made an impression on me. And since then, for the past 33 years, I have looked in the mirror every morning and asked myself, if today were the last day of my life, would I want to do what I am about to do today? And whenever the answer has been no for too many days in a row, I know I need to change something. Wow. To me, that was just so profound. Do you, do you feel like that's profound to you? If it is, would you just kind of say amen? Amen. That's profound. And so today, as we finish our discussion about looking at our journey on the road ahead, and specifically as we're talking about how do you recover from, how do you come back from, how do you survive, how do you even thrive after you experience a crash, a brick to the head moment, I really want to encourage you to think about that question deeply for a moment. If today were the last day of my life, if I knew that, if God had appeared to me this morning and said, this is it, today's your last day, midnight, boom, you're done. Would I want to do what I had planned to do for the day? Or would that change my plans? If I knew this was my last day, would that change what I did today? Would that change my focus? And if your honest answer is no for too many days in a row, no, I wouldn't do what I had planned, then you need to change something before you experience a crash. That's just a deep thought, to be sure. And so don't waste any time doing something you hate doing is one of the lessons we get out of that. If you keep going, even though you hate it, eventually you're going to crash, and it's not going to be pretty. And this particular type of uh, crash I call a passion crash. 
Are you experiencing a passing, passion crash in your life? And if so, then it's time to change something. It's time to take a different turn on the road ahead. Choose a different path. Because if you don't, boy, you're going to have a major crash. And many areas of your life are going to fall apart all at once. So that thought of just focusing on your passion, that's what continuously motivated Steve to be so incredibly successful, and more importantly, what drove Apple to be the global phenomenon that it still is today. And even when Steve got fired from Apple, after a few months of being depressed and kind of wound licking, he was just like, oh, woe is me. You know, what am I supposed to do now? I, my company got stolen from me. Now what am I supposed to do? He said he eventually realized he still loved what he did. So he started over in his area of passion. He founded a computer company called Next, and then he founded Pixar Studios, which makes computer-generated graphics animated films. And then in a remarkable turn of events, Apple bought Next, and Steve returned to Apple as the CEO, and he made it even better than it was before, because that was his passion. So here's what I want you to think about today. What are you passionate about? What are you passionate about? Focus on that, and you're going to experience success. If you don't, you're going to experience passion crashes. And Steve, he believed we're all capable of genius. We're all capable of changing the world for the better. He didn't think any of us were automatically relegated to being spectators. And the difference, according to him, came down to whether or not we maintained passion in what we were doing. I saw another interview where he was talking about this. He said, you know, people say you have to have a lot of passion for what you're doing, and it's totally true. And the reason is because it's so hard any rational person would give up. He said that's what happens to most people. If you really look at the ones that ended up being truly successful in the eyes of society and the ones that didn't, oftentimes the ones that are successful, it's because they really loved what they were doing so much that they could persevere whenever it got really tough. And the ones that didn't really love what they were doing, they didn't have a passion for it, they quit when things got tough. Why? Steve says because they're sane, right? No rational, sane person would keep doing something that was really hard if they didn't love it, if they didn't have a passion for it. They'd either quit and go do something they do love, or they would eventually crash and burn if they kept doing it. Jobs said this about Apple. It's not about making boxes for people to get their jobs done, although we do that well. Apple is about something more. Its core value is that we believe that people with passion can change the world for the better. Don't you think Jesus would agree with that? People with passion can change the world for the better. Steve says you've got to find what you love. The only way to do great work is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking. Don't settle. As with all matters of the heart, you'll know when you find it. And so on the road ahead, sometimes we feel like we've crashed and burned. It's really just because we've had a passion crash. We didn't recognize that we'd lost our passion. We'd lost our focus for what we were doing. We, we stopped paying attention to the road we were on. And we didn't correct our error in time, and so we crashed. It's not that somebody else caused this crash. We caused this crash ourselves by continuing on a path that was wrong for us. We essentially fell asleep at the wheel of life. I'll tell you an example of this. Uh, two weeks ago, I was in, uh, had a really tough week. I'd actually had a really tough month. Our adult son was living in Portland and he was going through a really difficult emotional time. And so that meant I was going through a really difficult emotional time. You parents know what I mean. He's still trying to find his passion in life. And so far it's been kind of a fruitless search and it's been incredibly exhausting and emotionally devastating for him. And I can relate to that. All through my 20s, it took me most of my 20s to find my passion in life as well. And so we were having a lot of really late night, early morning discussions between Hawaii and Oregon, right? And we were talking about this often. And I was exhausted. I was so tired. I wasn't sleeping. I was concerned about him. And then eventually he called me one day. And he said, I, I just want to come home. I just want to come home. I said, I'll be there tomorrow. I'll be there tonight. Actually, I got there, left at nine o'clock at night and got there the next morning at 8 a.m. And so we talked about it and said, let's bring you back home. We're just not really big city guys. We're kind of country boys at heart. We don't have any uh, desire to live in a massive metropolis. And he was there and he didn't have any close friends. He didn't have any family around him. And he's in this big city. It was just overwhelming. 
So I flew to Portland that night, last week, and I helped him close out his life there, and, and we came back home. And by the time we got back, it was late Friday night, and I was exhausted. And still, I wasn't able to sleep because I had two weddings to prepare for the next day. I still had a sermon to finish. I had to write up sermon notes and Aloha group questions and presentation slides. And I honestly had no idea how I was going to get all that done in time. So the first wedding was a morning wedding way down in Captain Cook, and Annette wasn't able to go with me. She had other things going on here at the church, so I had to drive myself. So I was just chugging coffee the whole way on that drive down trying to stay awake. And then the wedding finished, and it was time to drive back home. And on the way home, I was getting kind of that caffeine energy crash, you know, that you get after you've had a lot of caffeine. And then a couple hours later, your body's like, hey, can I have more? And you're like, no. And so it starts to fall asleep, right? So twice I caught myself asleep at the wheel going left of center on Queen K. And I woke up in time to avoid the crash, but I thought to myself, oh, that's how some of these head-on collisions happen here on this road. You could say, I lost my passion for driving home, right? In that moment, it was just honestly more important to me to sleep than to safely drive my vehicle. And once that happened the second time, Boy, I knew I had a problem. I I was going to have to find a way to rediscover my passion for driving home or I was going to die and probably take somebody with me. So I rolled the windows down, I cranked up the radio, and I just sang and shouted and talked to myself as loud as I could and prayed aloud to just kind of keep my passion for driving a car uh, until I got safely home. And so the minute I walked through the door, I just collapsed on my bed for a 90-minute nap until it was time to go to Edna and Adon's wedding uh, that evening, and Annette was able to drive me to that one. And then we got home from that, and I was still just exhausted, and I still hadn't finished my sermon, and I still hadn't done notes or any of that, and it's Saturday night, and I just pushed through, and I got it done. How was I able to do that? Because I love what I do. I love what I do. I have a passion for writing sermons and for performing weddings. I I love it. And the passion that I have for that, that's what drove me to complete it, even though it was really, really hard. Now, a loss of passion like me falling asleep at the wheel, that can lead to a crash in every area of life, not just driving, right? We can crash in a relationship setting. We can crash in a career setting. We can crash in a financial setting. We can crash in an educational setting simply because we've lost our passion for what we're doing. We wake up one day and we just realize, you know what? This doesn't matter to me anymore. We just don't love it anymore. We're not driven to spend all the time and energy in that area of life that's necessary anymore. Maybe you were going to college for a field that you were really passionate about at one time, and then one day you just realized, I don't care that much about this anymore. You weren't passionate about it anymore. And then maybe you kept going anyway. You kept pushing yourself forward in this area that you had no passion in. And so you crashed. You, you, you just, instead of switching majors, you ended up quitting college and walking away. Or maybe you actually got the degree in that field and then you went to work in that field and you were like, oh, I hate this. I hate this. Why am I doing this? Right? That's a passion crash. Or maybe you started off being a doctor or a teacher or whatever as a career and at first you loved it. Man, it was fantastic. It was fulfilling. It was exciting. And then you just woke up one day and you said, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't have a passion for it. I don't want to be a doctor. I don't want to be a teacher. I don't want to be a bus driver, whatever. That's a passion crash. Or maybe you moved somewhere because you had visited there several times. You thought, wow, that's great. I'd love to live there. And then after you lived there for a while, you just said, I'm not that crazy about this place anymore. I don't love it. I'm not passionate about it. I want to move back home. When you experience a crash like that, you have to stop and ask yourself, can I recover my passion for this thing? Should I recover my passion? Or is it really wise to just quit and go do something else? Do I still love what I'm doing? And if the answer is yes, then figure out how to rediscover your passion for it. Make what's old seem new again. If you're experiencing a crash in some area of your life, it may possibly be just because things have gotten hard recently and you've discovered you don't have enough passion for it. So you're ready to quit. Now, here's the thing. That may actually be the right decision. And I know we were all taught not to quit, right? Quitters never win. 
or, and winners never quit, right? That's not always true, though. Sometimes quitting is the best, wisest decision you can make. If you don't love it anymore, if you've lost your passion for it, maybe it's time. Maybe you just need to quit and walk away from it. Make way for someone else to come along and take off where you left off. Someone who actually does have a passion for it. That's the sane thing to do. So a lot of the crashes we experience on the road of life, they occur because we're attempting to do something we have no passion for, something we don't love, something we actually hate. Why are we in that position? Because often we're told we're supposed to figure out what our weaknesses are and then focus on strengthening your weaknesses, right? You get in a job and they say, figure out what your weaknesses are and work hard on those so that those weaknesses can become strengths, right? Instead of being good at one thing, we've bought into a mindset that encourages us to try to be adequate at many things instead. That doesn't lead to success on the road ahead. That leads to frequent crashes, what I call passion crashes. On the other hand, when you see somebody really following their passion, really focusing not on their weaknesses, but on their strengths, on their God-given calling and design, that's when they begin to really shine. That's when a band becomes the Beatles, right? That's when a fashion designer becomes Ralph Lauren, right? That's when a football player becomes Antonio Brown. That's when an inventor becomes Steve Jobs. That's when an actor becomes Tom Cruise. That's when a preacher becomes Andy Stanley. They know what their strengths are, so that's what they focus on. They have a passion for it, and they love what they do. Now, you know, I'm part of the John Maxwell team, and my friend John Maxwell, who's a leadership and success guru, he teaches us this. He says, focusing on weaknesses instead of strengths is like having a handful of coins, a few made of gold, pure gold, and the rest of tarnished copper, and setting aside the gold coins to spend all your time cleaning and shining the copper ones in hopes of making them look more valuable. No matter how long you spend on them, they will never be worth what the gold coins are. Go with your greatest assets. Don't waste your time. Don't let your weaknesses get in the way of you reaching your full potential. Focus on what you do well and capitalize on that. Now, having said all that, some things in life, like your family, your faith, loving God, loving other people, they're so important, we can't walk away from them. We can't quit those things because we've been commanded by our Creator to love them, to be passionate about them. So if you've lost your passion for things like that, it's because you're sinning. You're not doing what God's called you, told you, commanded you to do. One day Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So when you start to experience a passion crash in regard to loving other people or loving God, you have to find a way to rediscover your passion for them. They are supposed to be strengths for all of us. We're not allowed to crash in those areas. Or we can crash, but we've got to find a way to survive and thrive after that crash. Any person who claims the title Christ follower has to fully consider this question. Am I still passionate about following Jesus? Am I passionate about it? Is it just something I'm kind of interested in or am I passionate about it? And I don't want you to answer that question too quickly. Think about the ramifications of that. Are you really passionate about following Jesus? Would you do anything, give anything, risk anything to pursue that passion? You've got the title Christ follower, but are you passionate about it? If I asked your 10 closest friends and family, would they honestly describe you as someone who is passionate about Jesus Christ? Are you passionate about the mission he gave you to love God and to love other people? And if the answer is no, you've got to recover from this passion crash. You've got to do something different. This is one area of your life you're not allowed to quit. You've got to recover from that crash. Don't lose faith. So how do we do that? How do we recover from a passion crash? Jesus gives us the answer in his exhortation to a church in Ephesus in Revelation 2. And this applies to all of us as individuals as well. But I have this against you. You have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I'm coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. 
So there's two clear steps here. This is the wisdom we need for how to survive and recover from any crash in life, especially passion crashes. Jesus says, number one, remember. The first step is to uh, get back on the road after a crash. The first step is to remember. Whether it's a crash that was your fault or a crash that was someone else's fault, remember. Remember where you were before the crash happened. Remember that great feeling you had, that positivity you had, that passion you had when you had a clear goal of where you were heading on the road ahead. You remember that? You remember that feeling? You remember that love? You remember that passion? Go back there before the crash happened so you can take another run at the road ahead. The second step is repent. Was some part of this crash your fault? Were you going the wrong way? Were you going too fast? Were you going too slow? Did you make a wrong turn? Did you lose focus? Did you stop paying attention? Did you lose your passion? Repent of that behavior. That means don't do that anymore. Do the opposite instead. Stop going the wrong way. Make a U-turn and go back the right way instead. That's what the word repent means. And Jesus said, remember when you were doing the good things, the right things, the passionate things, go do those things again. Stop doing the wrong things, the things you don't have passion for, the things you don't love, the things that aren't part of your following Jesus. Go do the right things instead. And this may mean don't pursue a thing in life anymore. If you don't have a passion for it, you don't love it, stop going that way. Quit. Go a different way in an area you're still passionate about instead. And when it comes to following Jesus... It means remember and return to your first love level of passion for him. Remember when you first met Jesus and you first figured out how much he loves you and you wanted to love him in return? That's what we need to remember and that's what we need to return to. Remember the heights from which you have fallen. Repent and return to those. Every single crash in life is a survivable crash when you're following Jesus. Maybe you can't do some of the things you could do before the crash, but you can still love God and you can still love other people. And that's the primary purpose of your life anyway. Everything else is secondary. And you know what? Even if a crash literally kills you, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're still going to survive that crash because this life is not all there is. This life's just practice for the real life that's awaiting us next, eternal life in the presence of God, where crashes will never happen again. So stay focused on that goal, and you're going to recover from and survive any crash you encounter along the road ahead. If you don't have that eternal assurance of knowing Jesus that I'm talking about, I'm going to give you a chance to have that assurance when we pray in just a few minutes. But would you do me a favor and stand, and let's sing our closing song together. This is about Jesus. He's going to stand in the fire beside of you. He's going to be with you whenever you encounter a crash in life. He's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. You can trust him. Father God, for all those listening to this message, whether they're here in this room or watching later online, if they've never begun a relationship with you the way we're talking about today, if they don't have this passion for Jesus like I'm describing it today, let today be the moment that changes their life forever. They could just pray a prayer like this. Jesus, I have confidence that you are who you say you are and that you'll do what you've promised to do. I believe that you are the Son of God, that you are God in the flesh, that you came to earth to show us the way home, to show us the way to eternal life with God. So Jesus, please forgive me for all the sins, all the times I've rebelled against you, for all the times I've tried to be the God of my own life. Please forgive me. Thank you for adding my sins to those you bore on the cross. Wash me clean. Give me a brand new start. I want to follow you, Jesus. You be the God of my life. You're God, I'm not. You lead, I'll follow. Be the Lord, the CEO, the manager, the director of my life. You lead, I'll follow. Be the Savior of my life, the only one who can wash away my sins, the only one who can give me a brand new start so that I can experience eternal life and abundant life in this life. Jesus, be the Lord and Savior of my life. If that's the prayer of your heart, you could just say, me too, God, me too. That's what I want, me too. God, for all of us who know you already, help us if we have lost our passion for doing your work, if we've lost our passion for being your 
uh, envoy to the world, to be the ones who share the good news. God, help us rediscover that passion. Help us remember the heights from which we have fallen. Help us repent of the things we're doing that aren't what you would call us to do and help us go the right direction again on the road ahead. That's the only way we're going to survive the crashes that will come our way. But if we do that, we'll not only survive, we'll thrive. So God, I bless the people here in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit that they would be people who would always maintain their passion for whatever it is you've called them to do in life and most importantly, that they would retain their passion for following you, for loving God, and for loving other people. I bless them in Jesus' name. Amen.